first part in a fun two-part experiment where we're going to be synthesizing a common headache medicine, aspirin, starting from a natural product. So oil of wintergreen is also known as methyl salicylate. And we're going to start with this natural product and do two steps in order to produce uh, aspirin. And the first step, which is the focus of this part one, is the hydrolysis or saponification of the ester of methyl salicylate. And we'll do this under basic conditions using sodium hydroxide. In this case, it's six molar sodium hydroxide. And we're gonna add heat. So that delta symbol there sometimes uh, refers to heat. And we're gonna heat this, actually kind of boil it for about 15 minutes. And this will affect the, uh, the hydrolysis. And then we're gonna be left with, essentially, uh, what we'll be left with is a deprotonated carboxylic acid that we will need to protonate using sulfuric acid. Now, when I say there's a deprotonated carb uh, carboxylic acid, where does that kind of come from here? Well, let's take a quick look at the mechanism for this reaction. So if I erase just a couple things, you notice the product here is salicylic acid. That may also be something that's familiar uh, to you. It's used um, actually as a medicine itself uh, to put on warts and other things. Um, so here, if we just think about the mechanism for a moment, we're using sodium hydroxide. So I'm gonna have OH minus uh, as kind of the, the reactant species here. And it's kind of a, a normal kind of um, uh, acyl substitution type of mechanism. So the hydroxide comes and attacks the carbonyl carbon. This initially swings up to give me a tetrahedral intermediate. So if I draw this out a little bit, uh, we are now going to have, um, we'll have the OH, we'll have the O methyl, and then we'll have an O minus. This O minus is going to swing back down and kick off the methoxide uh, group essentially here. And so this will then give me uh, essentially a carboxylic acid at first. Sorry. OH, and then I'll have the carboxylic acid. But I've just spit out a decently strong base here, um, CH3 minus, and so I have essentially an acid and a base. So this comes back, takes off that hydrogen, and leaves you with the deprotonated carboxylic acid. So this is what I was referring to earlier. So that leaves you with the carboxylate here at the end of the reaction, and then methanol essentially as a byproduct. And then to kind of isolate this material, we need to then protonate this using sulfuric acid. So at the end of the reaction, after it's completed, we'll simply acidify the solution using H2SO4, and that will give me kind of my final product here, the final salicylic acid, OH, OH there, with the carboxylic acid. And that will complete part one. Now, when we do this, when we do this protonation, so initially this deprotonated species here, because it's charged, is water soluble. And we should be somewhat familiar with that from the extraction lab. When you protonate it, it becomes neutral and water insoluble. So we'll often get a precipitate to just crash out of solution. And that precipitate may not be very pure. Now it may be, but it may not be very pure at first, especially if I have a little bit of residual starting material or depending on how great the conversion of the starting material is, uh, this may kind of be trapped in that precipitate. And so what I will then do after I get kind of this powdery material as a precipitate, I then need to do a recrystallization. So a technique we learned earlier in the semester, a recrystallization on this material to really ensure that it is uh, nice and pure before I take that salicylic acid and then use it as the starting material for the second step in the synthesis of aspirin. So that's just a brief overview of kind of what's going on specifically in terms of the steps and the mechanism for this reaction. Let's go up to lab, grab our PPE and get this reaction started.
So here we are ready to begin part one of the synthesis of aspirin. And so we're going to start with the natural product, the oil of wintergreen, otherwise known as methyl salicylate. Here. And I'll measure out four milliliters of this. Now I could use a graduated cylinder, but in this case I actually have a handy large micro pipette that I can set to four milliliters. So this is larger than a normal micro pipette but this should give me reasonable accuracy for that. So I'll measure that out into a reasonably sized beaker here with the added stir bar to agitate the solution. After I've got that set on the stir plate, I will then measure out 40 milliliters of six molar sodium hydroxide, add that in. And then I want to bring the solution to a gentle boil. So I'll probably set the hot plate a little bit above 100 and have the temperature probe set into the solution. And then we'll bring this to a gentle boil and then boil the mixture for approximately 15 minutes. After that point, we can cool the solution and neutralize it using nonmolar sulfuric acid. So let's go ahead and get started with the setup. Notice initially that a white precipitate forms. A lot of this is just sodium hydroxide that has come out of solution when we mixed it with the methyl salicylate. We don't want to use distilled water to so sort of rinse this solid down the sides of the beaker as we boil the solution. So we'll set our um, temperature probe into the solution, set the stirring on, and then begin to heat the solution and use a little bit of distilled water to rinse this solid down the sides to keep it in solution. The solution has now reached a gentle boil. We'll let this sit here, probably turn the stirring back on uh, for about 15 minutes, and then we'll stop the reaction and work up the solution.
All right, now that the reaction has run for approximately 15 minutes, we can take it off uh, and turn off the stirring. Now, unlike the procedure, which says to put this directly into an ice bath, it's not generally a good idea to put hot glassware into uh, a cold, freezing cold bath. And so instead what we'll do is we'll simply place it on the countertop to cool uh, down closer to room temperature and then place it in an ice bath before we add the nine molar sulfuric acid. has cooled a little bit, we can now place it in an ice bath. And we'll let this chill further before adding the nine molar sulfuric acid. Now we'll measure out approximately 50 milliliters of nine molar sulfuric acid. No, a slight change in the procedure, nine molar sulfuric acid being used instead of eight molar sulfuric acid. It really doesn't make any difference. It's just, we happen to have nine molar sulfuric acid already made up in the stock room. And so there was no need to make up a separate bottle just simply to have eight molar sulfuric acid. Essentially what we're doing with this is simply neutralizing the solution. So after we have added the sulfuric acid into uh, the reaction mixture and we'll want to do this very very slowly and carefully in the ice bath You're essentially adding a strong acid to a strong base and expect there to be a lot of heat evolved from that reaction So we want to do that carefully in the ice bath and then after we're done We'll test the pH of the solution just with some litmus paper just to tell us if we have in fact uh, neutralized the solution or, or made it acidic uh, so we should have protonated any um, decarboxylated, or not decarboxylated, um, any uh, carboxylate salt that uh, would be left over from the, uh, or that would be the product from the hydrolysis. And then we'll let that sit in an ice bath for quite a while to form crystalline material. We should see precipitate form when we add the sulfuric acid to the uh, reaction mixture. So we'll begin by measuring out our 50 milliliters of nonmolar sulfuric acid. It's not critical in this case since I'm use, simply using the sulfuric acid to neutralize the solution and protonate the, the carboxylate that results from the base hydrolysis. Uh, it's not crucial to use exactly 50 milliliters. Here I have slightly more than 50 milliliters, just about 52, but this is now sufficient. I'll now very carefully add this into the reaction mixture. see the fuming that's occurring as I add this it's because of the very rapid and strong reaction between the, the base, the very strong base, and the very strong acid. So I'll actually use a little bit of distilled water here just to carefully sort of rinse some of the solid down. I've only added a little bit of the sulfuric acid. So be very careful to do this in the ice bath and very slowly. You can already see I've formed a lot of this solid product.
Lower that down in the ice bath a little bit more. Added the entirety of the sulfuric acid. And stir the solution up. Then make sure that everything has a chance to react. Sort of protonate, neutralize. It's a good thing that I have this in the ice bath, otherwise, this would be very hot and probably boil and overflow the reaction of just the beaker here. So at this point, I'm just going to leave it sitting buried in the ice bath and let that sit until it's fully chilled and then all of the material has had a chance to either precipitate out as you see with this kind of white material or crystallize if there's any kind of remaining in solution. So we'll let that fully chill and then from there we'll isolate the solid product. We've let that chill for a little while now we're going to just test the solution pH just to see if it's acidic really quickly using some blue litmus paper. A piece of blue litmus paper here. I'll take the glass stir rod, sort of dip it in here to the solution, touch it. Oh, and what we see is definitely a clear change to pink. This is definitely acidic. There should be no base remaining at this point. And we're now all set to take this over to, and collect the solid by filtration. So here I am at the filtering station. Uh, I've got my crude product here still in the ice bath. And I have a slightly different funnel set up than we've done before. So this is known as a Buchner funnel, not a Hirsch funnel. Rather than being kind of um, conical here, this one is a little bit more flat and uses a larger filter paper. So this is good for slightly larger scale um, filtrations like we've got here. I'm gonna take a piece of filter paper. The process is very, very similar to using the Hirsch funnel. It's just a slightly larger scale. I'm gonna take a piece of filter paper, put that onto the Buchner funnel. I'll turn on the water aspirator. And then I want to wet my filter paper, make sure that it stays really adhered to the filter. So I'll wet that with some distilled water. That should be good and sucked onto that filter now. And now I can simply take my crude material here. See a lot of white solid, mostly precipitate, not really much in the way of crystals per se, but a lot of just kind of powdery looking material. I'm just sort of swirl this up some and then begin to pour that gently and carefully onto the funnel. I'll rinse the beaker with a little bit of distilled water, help carry some of this solid forward. And I'm being careful to leave the stir bar behind in the beaker each time. Finally, at the end, I'll just rinse the uh, material on the filter paper directly just to help remove any residual sulfuric acid uh, from the precipitated material.
so you have quite a lot of material here. We'll pull air through this for a while and just let it dry. I will now weigh a clean, dry beaker that I will use to collect my crude salicylic acid in. So now that I've pulled air through it for a while, I can disconnect the water aspirator and turn it off. And then I can begin to collect my crude product. So here you'll see it's in the, just kind of in the funnel right here. There's a lot of material there. And I bet that even though we pulled air through it for a while, that it's not very dry. I bet that uh, there's still some residual water in there. So what we're going to do is we've weighed our beaker already. We're going to scrape it into the beaker and then place it in the oven for 10 to 15 minutes before we get a crude yield. So it's kind of a large cake of material. Kind of all came out together. I'm going to try to leave my filter paper behind. I'm going to grab that off to the side, set that back, that's now the majority of the material. I've got this in here, and, and you can tell it's, it's somewhat powdery, but it's still a little wet. So I'm going to take this and try to break it up as much as possible so that it will dry the easiest. I'm kind of stirring that up there, breaking up the large chunks. You can see it's fairly powdery, but it just still feels just a little bit uh, just still feels a little bit wet. So I'm going to go put this into the oven and then we'll let that sort of dry for about 10 to 15 minutes before we get a final mass for the crude product. We can now get a crude mass for our very powdery material, powdery salicylic acid. At this point, we will set aside a small amount of the material for crude NMR analysis, and we will also prep a melting point sample for the crude material before we go on and then purify the crude salicylic acid by recrystallization. So here I'll prep my melting point sample. Using the powdery material. That should be sufficient. And then to prep the NMR sample, I'll just take a small scoopful of material, place it in a clean Erlenmeyer flask, and then I'll dissolve that, or attempt to dissolve it, in approximately half a milliliter of deuterated chloroform, common NMR solvents here. I've included a pasture pipette here with some cotton filtering uh, right here in case I'm not able to dissolve all of the material and then I can use that filter pipette to remove the solid material before transferring into the NMR tube.
So I'm going to swirl this around, try to get everything dissolved. It was actually relatively clear. Not 100% dissolved, but most of that material seems to have dissolved. And so the very small amount of solid material remaining, I won't worry too much about. It'll be all right if that gets into the NMR tube. Uh, you can see the vast majority there of the material is soluble. If there were more insoluble material, uh, then I would need to use the filter pipette, which I prepped in case. I'll now transfer this into the um, NMR tube. Cap the NMR tube here. And then I'll set this aside to do a crude NMR after I have finished with the recrystallization and gotten some pure uh, crystallized material to do a purified NMR for comparison. So to perform the recrystallization of the crude salicylic acid, what I've first done is taken a large beaker with water and placed it on the hot plate and now get it, uh, I've gotten it to the point where it is starting to boil. So it's very hot water. And then I want to add that hot water into my um, solid material here to get everything dissolved. Now, once I've added uh, a little bit of water, once I've added enough water to kind of cover the surface of the, the bottom of the beaker here, I'm going to want to place this on the hot plate as well to keep the solution hot. Because ideally I want to dissolve all of the solid material in hot water and then let it cool down and using the change in solubility between hot and cold solution, uh, hope to recrystallize our material. Now, I don't want to place it directly on the hot plate uh, before I've added water into there because I don't want to just singe the solid material or burn it. Um, I want to have that water to help kind of mitigate the, uh, the heat transfer. So I'll, I'll take some, some oven gloves. I'll remove the sort of boiling stick from the kind of boiling water here. I'll initially just pour some of this in to help kind of cover the surface, bottom surface there. Sort of swirl that around some and then place this directly on the hot plate with it. Now you'll notice, you know, most of the material is still not dissolved in any way, shape or form. And so, but I'm going to place it right on the hot, uh, on the hot, hot plate there. I can stir with a stir rod here to help sort of break up material. And then from this point, I just want to kind of add, uh, I want to start to add hot boiling water to this um, beaker here until I get everything dissolved. Now to do that, I just take uh, a pipette and I may need quite a bit here given the sort of volume, but I'll just take a pipette, sort of grab some of that hot water and then start to squirt that in here to the beaker that has the product that we're trying to get to recrystallize. I'll sort of keep adding until at least I've got most of the material off the side walls and it feels like I've got a decent amount of, of water in there. I obviously don't want to use too much, but I need to have enough to dissolve the, the material. Now, I'm just going to let this solution that I'm creating right here actually boil. As it begins to boil, you'll notice the solid begin to dissolve and I'll just have to add enough solvent, enough water here to allow that to occur. So you should be able to see in a little bit as this solution boils, you should be able to see that solid begin to dissolve. We'll go until we get all of the solid completely dissolved.
add quite a bit of water uh, and the solution is boiling but still not fully dissolving here uh, you can you can see some of that material dissolving we'll definitely let that boil for a little bit uh, at this point we'll sort of let this boil for a little while see if we can get all of that material dissolved if we can't we'll probably just add the the small amount of remaining water from the uh, sort of reservoir beaker and if we need to we can add more distilled water using just the the water bottle note that that will cool the system down when we do uh, we'll have to um, we'll, we'll have to then sort of uh, let it heat back up again but here we can see as, as we're boiling quite vigorously a lot of materials dissolving but certainly not not everything we have to worry a little bit about losing some volume at this point I think it would probably be appropriate to add the remaining water from the initial beaker. Just taking a little bit maybe more liquid at first. You see that sort of cooled, cooled it down a little bit. We'll let that boil again. And then add more distilled water as necessary to dissolve all of the material. Once everything is dissolved, we can remove the beaker from the hot plate and let it cool and crystallize. definitely made progress. All of this material really needs to be completely soluble before we are able to let this cool and crystallize. So I'm going to use the uh, small distilled water and add just a bit more water to this. We'll sort of start by just kind of rinsing things down. Then we do need to sort of increase the volume. Now initially as that cools you'll see actually the formation of solid as a lot of material kind of comes back out of solution due to the temperature change. This really tells me that we're very, very close to kind of a saturated, completely saturated solution here. We need to increase the volume and let this boil again to get us to uh, be able to get everything fully dissolved. <music> Upon adding, certainly a lot of material sort of crashed out of solution, became insoluble because of that temperature change. We'll let this get back up to a boil and see if we can get everything fully dissolved. that all of the solid has dissolved. We will now turn off the heat and let the system cool slowly uh, and crystallize.
now that the solution is cooled, we are ready to collect the crystallized material by filtration. So we'll go ahead and collect those crystals by filtration. You can see if I remove the wash glass from the top and, and really look carefully inside, we have some really nice crystalline material in there. Some very nice needles. So I'll turn the water aspirator on. I've got a piece of filter paper in here already. I'll wet that, make sure that adheres to the filter very well, and then sort of just swirl this up, make sure we can kind of get those crystals suspended. And then collect those by filtering down through. A lot of the material kind of stayed behind. I'll pour that forward. We'll grab a spatula real quick, sort of scrape these onto the filter, and then rinse the whole system with some distilled water. Now we'll let air pull through the system for a while to dry those crystals. Then we'll collect them and uh, we'll, we'll weigh a beaker, collect those, and put them in the oven for a while to dry, and then get a final mass, a melting point, and NMR for the purified material. We're all set to put this in the oven now. We're all set to get the final mass of the purified salicylic acid. At this point, we will get a melting point and an NMR for both the crude and purified salicylic acid samples.